Turntablism for me is a way of expressing myself. Who to you is the biggest game changer in turntablism? I used to battle and I used to find it fun, but now I've moved on from that, you know what I mean? I still respect it and everything. So on paper, you're better than him. And if it hasn't happened, just make something up. <laughs> no one watches the channel anyway. <laughs> <laughs> There's two people left, and those two people are you and Prime Cuts. Oh man, come on. You're losing, no, right? Oh no, come on, that. And I won five IDA UK titles. You could have always answered by saying, look, if I'm not scratching the records, I'll be scratching my balls. Which one works better for you? <laughs> 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 On the 521 sofa today, we have eight-time UK DJ champion. This is a guy who's 100% put in the hours and then gone on to use the experience to start a business which can help events, clubs, and DJs across all genres. So if you're a DJ, this could benefit you if you don't already know. But before we begin, please subscribe to the channel, click the bell to receive the notifications, like, share, and get involved in the comment section below. Right. We're going to get straight into this with my man, eight-time UK champ, DJ Rasp. How you doing, bro? I'm good, thanks. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. You know what? First of all, I have to say you made a hell of a journey to get here. Yeah. And you carried your mixer, records, yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. So, bro, thank you for doing that. Appreciate all good. that. All good, man. Where do you want to start with this? Because I, I know you've got quite a deep history. Yeah. And... I'm guessing a lot of people that aren't into DJing aren't going to know about what you've achieved, what you've done, what you're doing now. So before we go deep into everything, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Okay, yeah. I started in 1996. I was a kid who used to collect records, you know, uh, got some cheap belt drive turntables and got hooked on it, you know. Uh, started making mixtapes and then started, uh, you know, DJing in bars and little house parties and stuff like that. Then progressed on to playing clubs, and then I got into the, like the battle scene, and uh, started, you know, getting into turntablism and all that type of thing. Um, and then, yeah, I eventually uh, hooked up with a few like rap crews from Merseyside, and uh, yeah, just started like jamming with them, and ended up like you know producing and touring with them and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just been a yeah, it's been a fun journey. These rap crews that you were working with, whose idea was it to start the groups? Was it the rappers looking for a DJ? Was it you looking for rappers? Yeah, uh, it was rappers looking for a DJ. And uh, I ended up uh, with a crew, we was called the Shakti. It was from Merseyside and, and Liverpool. And uh, I actually knew, I knew of one of the rappers, a rapper called Philly Wiz. He went to the same school as me, but I didn't know him in school. He was a bit older than me. And some lad from round ours, he's like, oh, I know some guys who want to uh, rap with a DJ. Do you, would you be interested? I was like, yeah, go on. So we ended up jamming. He brought his friend along called Ash Nugent. He's a, you know, he's a writer now. He, he writes books and stuff. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, he brought our other friend along uh, called Mac, Mac of all trades. And then we just uh, created this little uh, unit, you know, of people brought out some ideas, we was all creating, and then we eventually did gigs and went on to, uh, you know, press up records and produce our own thing. And, you know, get we got a singer involved called Charlene Squire. And, uh, you know, we ended up getting a live band and doing a few gigs. And we started that in 1999, and it kind of like, you know, finished around about 2005, 2006. But it was a fun ride. And we're all still cool with each other, you know, just everyone like moves separate ways and does different things with their lives and that. How far did your achievements go with the group? Uh, we did quite a few gigs. We, we, it was more on a local level, but we played quite a few national gigs, you know, different cities. We come to London, uh, was it the Muff Jam in Brixton? I think, I think that's what it was called. Yeah, we played there a few times. Um, yeah, we played a few gigs around the country. We ended up doing a little local spot on Granada TV. And uh, yeah, we pressed up a few records as well. You know, we pressed up uh, the Shakti Pack um, EP, uh, the Single File EP. 
And uh, we did another one called Pour Me and Selling a Weed EP. And yeah, we, we did a few uh, solo projects too. How did you hook up with the Moth Jam guys? Through Philly Ways, uh, knowing some, some people down, down here in London. And um, yeah, he just like got the connection. And they come and see us actually in Liverpool. And then they invited us to do a few of the gigs. And that was like 2005, 2004, around that period. That was the first time we all went to London as a crew. And yeah, we did a few gigs and we got on with the lads. And yeah, we met a few other like artists that was on the scene at the time. And yeah, it was cool. What was the scene like at the time? Was, um, was it kind of hard for you being from outside of London? Was it easier because people were like more kind of excited about people getting into the scene in London? Yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was exciting for us because we don't come to London much, you know, as a crew. You know, I've, I've been to London a few times before that when, when I used to do the DJ battles and that. Uh, but as a crew, for us to make the adventure down to London and perform along the, you know, the London guys and girls, it, it was good, good to do, man, you know. Talk us through one of the, the journeys to London. Like right. some, what was the most abstract, weird, uh, troublesome even situation that's happened. Because when we used to travel outside of London to go to other places, we caused mayhem on them buses, um, trains, whatever. Well, you know, it's just uh, <laughs> some things I don't want to say. <laughs> just say it. Like, no, no, <laughs> no, nah, nah, it, it wasn't that bad. It's just, you know, a couple of lads going down, either on the coach, having a bit of a laugh, you know, having a bit of a drink, a smoke. Or whatever and yeah just having a bit of a buzz really and you know sometimes missing public transport and getting stranded in little train stations and stuff like that and uh yeah we ended up like sleeping in some mad uh hotel uh, so well it was just a room and it just had like a fridge and just one bed so you know all sleeping on floors and stuff and it was yeah, it was just a bit mad and that late. And yeah, it was just fun, fun times. It was a long time ago that though. It was like, you know, 2004, 2005. It's yeah, all I mean, the adventure, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's part of the journey. Yeah, defo. And, and it kind of, in some ways, helps to build the character that you are or that you become for the future. Yeah, like you said, it's character building. You know, yeah. it's good. Do you remember the biggest show you did? And As a shakti? Yeah. Um... Because I know as a DJ, you've done massive things as well. So, uh, so as, as, the, as the group itself. Yeah, we played, uh, we played quite a few shows in Liverpool. Uh, we supported some decent acts. We supported Master Ace and Black Twang. Um, we supported uh, a good gig. It was with Goldie Look and Chain. Them guys from Wales, yeah, when, okay. when they was at the peak. Bro, you don't have to tell me yeah, who they are. They are mad, them guys. <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull moment when they're around. But yeah, they, they smashed it. You know, we were supporting them. At what stage did you kind of look at DJing and say, this is for me? When I started, I, the reason I started DJing is because I had a record collection, you know, collecting mainly rap stuff and hip hop stuff. But I like other music as well, like rock and dance music and reggae and you know, soul and all kinds of stuff. And um, what I used to do, I used to create like pause tapes, you know, so we had a, you know, my auntie would give me this hi-fi with a turntable and a tape deck on it. So what I'd do, I'd, you know, create like cassette tapes so I could listen to it on my Walkman while I'm riding around on my BMX, you know. And then I thought, why not uh, get two decks and a mixer and see if we can blend them together and give me something to do. So I saved up some money. I was working in warehouses and all that back in the day. I was only like 18 or something. I got some belt drive turntables. And uh, yeah, I just got hooked into like, you know, making mixtapes and just manipulating the records and, you know, experimenting with scratching and beat juggling and all that type of thing. And yeah, uh, I'd say I started taking it serious Probably, you know, after like a few years of doing it, probably about 99, that's when I thought, okay, maybe I could do something with this, you know. I started getting little bookings for like, you know, the old bar gig or the old club gig or whatever, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, I, th I think from then, that, that, that was my goal then to, you know, progress with it. 
What was the support like from your friends when you started? Were, were you getting people encouraging you or more people bantering with you like, ah, you'll never make it, you're shit? <laughs> yeah, a bit of both. A bit of both, you know. So which one do you think drove you to, to be successful in what you did? Um, what you do? Yeah, a bit of both, really. Like, some people didn't understand it. Do you get what I mean? Uh, like, sometimes I play some house parties. Like I'm from St. Helens, which is a, a, a northern town just in Merseyside, and I play some little house parties, and some people will be buzzing off it, and some people are like, oh, I just play the record or whatever, you know, when, when I'm scratching and stuff. And some people got it, and other people, it just went over the head. And, you know, I was only young and learning and, you know, inexperienced at the time. So I think both, uh, uh, both comments, you know, from negative comments and positive comments drove me to, okay, I'm just going to do it. You know, it felt good doing it, you know what I mean? It felt good to be on the turntables, to be cutting up and, uh, you know, creating mixes and, you know, watching crowd reactions and watching people dance and stuff like that. You know, it was a good good feeling, so I just stuck with it. So what do you prefer, the, the club side of it, where you're playing records and watching people enjoying themselves, or do you prefer the technical side where you're on the turntables and actually doing turntablism? and people are just watching in awe. I like them both for different reasons, and I like to combine the two together. Uh, turntablism for me is a way of expressing myself, you know, scratching or creating a routine or beat juggling or whatever. It's a good way for me to, you know, really express myself and get lost and it's really good escapism for me. Uh, you know, I like playing in clubs as well. Uh, you know, making people dance and, you know, just creating nice vibes and a good atmosphere for people. Because I, I play all kinds of music now. When I first started, I was playing a lot of hip-hop stuff. But I, I branched out, you know, and I play, like, a lot of multi-genre style sets now, you know what I, I think mean? it's easier nowadays, isn't it? You're not going to yeah. get stoned and no, beaten no. up outside because you played, I don't know, Madonna yeah, in it, the middle of a public yeah, enemy song. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the times are very different now. Yeah. People are a lot more open-minded when it comes to music. And I think that's true. Even, even some of the elders as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. There's some that I haven't, but, you know. Well, I think that's due to technology, like the iPod generation, Spotify. People are just, you know, into everything nowadays. You know what I mean? Uh, like, everything that's pretty much free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we have YouTube as well, you know what yeah. I mean? So you can watch, you, you can listen to any song at any time of the day, you know, because we all have mobile phones and laptops and all that. You know, it's very accessible, isn't it? You know what I mean? How, so how has that affected what you do in terms of a lot being available for, for nothing? Like, this is your income, this is your livelihood, but yet everything you have to give away free to get a little bit of attention. Well, the game's changed a lot, you know what I mean? And I blame you for that. <laughs> Maybe we should blame technology. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's easier to blame you, isn't it? Uh, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll, And you're smaller I'll, than me. I'll, I'll, I'll hold my hands up, like. <laughs> <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> Sorry, people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think technology's changed a lot, and it's changed a lot of people's listening habits, you know what I mean? Um, and I don't know whether it's for the better or for worse i don't know it's a it's a double-edged sword pros and cons and yeah everything. definitely definitely um you know i do miss the old days but we live in 2023 and you know this is how it is now so you gotta adapt but i will say this i'm very grateful you know i'm the age i am i was brought up in the time i was brought up and um I experienced the, like the analog uh, ways of music, like going to the record shops and being excited about a new release, a new 12 inch or album or whatever, and you know, saving up all my money and you know, buying a, a record, taking home and really getting into it, you know what I mean? Like now, uh, people don't have uh, long attention spans because you can just like, oh, I'm bored of that song, within 20 seconds you'll swipe onto the next. And you know what I mean? It, I'm really glad I've come from that era where you appreciate music, you know what I mean? And, you know, I'm not saying all the stuff is bad today because some of the stuff is great, like some of the technology is great. As a DJ, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. Like I'm into DJing with video stuff now, you know what I mean? And using all the technology. Talk me through one of your experiences in walking in a record shop. Like if I give you an example of what I'm trying to get at here, 
yeah. is when I went looking for records, it was a multiple reason why I would pick up a certain record. One would be because I knew what it was and I was after it. Yeah, or the other reason being that it was a group I recognized, so I would be like, yeah, they're reliable. Um, and then there was other reasons, such as I would pick up a cover and the cover would interest me. Or if I flip into the back of the cover, I'd see the credits and see who's involved. Like, say, if there's a drummer. Like, yeah. if I see Billy Cobham, I'm picking it up. Yeah. If I see Chick Corea, I'm picking it up. You know, so talk us through one of your experiences. Okay, yeah, it's all of them reasons, what you just said then about the records. Um, but also, you know, the gamble of going into a record shop, seeing a new cover or a new artist, listening to it in the record shop and thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll take a chance on that, you know. Uh, as From a DJ's point of view, is that going to be banging in the club? Or is that going to rock the dance floor? Or could I use that to sample? Or could I take a little phrase from the a cappella? You know, is the a cappella good quality? Can I take a phrase from that and use it in a turntable set or cut it up with my band or put it on a mix tape or whatever, you know what I mean? Make a mashup with it. So yeah, uh, lots of different reasons really. You said a cappella. So did you specifically pick up certain records in the hope? Like say for example, you heard Far Side. Um, did you pick up a record hoping there was an a cappella because you heard a couple of lines in there that you thought you could use in a battle? And Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, some records I've specifically got uh, for the a cappellas, you know what I mean? Uh, for, for scratching, you know, that's, I'm, most of the time I like the song as well, but yeah, there has been certain songs that I've hunted down, especially when I was in a band and we was recording tracks. Oh, we need a phrase with that. Well, that guy raps about it, you know what I mean? So... Yeah, let's see if we can get an a cappella of that. And sometimes you couldn't get the a cappella, so you had to like drop the bass off it and, and cut with it that way. You know, like DJ Premier does that a lot, but he makes it work really, really well. You know what I mean? Um, well, I mean, they spent about 10 days in the studio just to do that little bit. So they had the budget we didn't have. Yeah, we didn't you know? have that. We just, so, but, you know, it was, it was the fun elements of searching for them, like little samples, you know. But now... You know, I was saying about the technology, you can do all of that stuff. You can have instant acapellas and instant instrumentals now with some of this de new DJ technology, which is incredible. As a rapper and a producer myself, there was um, one specific record that I always went to because I knew there was something I would get out of that. No matter what, there was always something on that record I could get. Is there a record for you that does that? Wow, there's so many. <laughs> so many. If you have to name up. one, what's the oh, most cut-up a cappella you've got? To the point where you've destroyed the record and had to steal your friend's one. Oh, wow. Um, While you're thinking, I'll tell you what my one is. Yeah. OC, time's up. Oh, yeah, that is a good one. You lack the minerals and vitamins. Yeah. Uh, hear the drummer get wicked. You know, the public enemy sample. I've cut that up a few times. Oh, there's so many to think about uh, but yeah OC's Time's Up a cappella is, is a good one to use the more emotion I put in it the harder rock, oh, uh, all yeah. that type of stuff you know what I mean I've seen some like... people use that in battles and yeah just the, his voice the way his, his, vo his vocals were recorded was great you know what I mean crazy I've cut up some of your a cappellas before as oh well, my god man. you took it there <laughs> Jesus I'm going to have to sue you now <laughs> um, which, one, which one of mine did you cut uh, from the World Lab Okay. The, what, what did I use? Uh, the time is over and finally we're here. Yeah. Uh, we used it on our Shatsy pack, 12-inch. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to call my lawyer. Go and do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been any situations where you thought, you know what, that guy's a prick, man. I'm gonna, I don't know, I'm going to bottle him or something. Nah, nah, not really, man. You know, as, you know, as, a, as a crew, when we was younger... You know, obviously, you're doing young stuff. There might be, oh, Just you know, wrong. yeah, a bit of that going on, or a bit of, little bit of ego. You know, with, with battles and all of that type of thing, I've, I've, you know, I've seen it happen. You know what I mean? Not with myself, but I've seen it happen with B boy crews battling each other, and you know, uh, DJs and all this, and some rappers. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, we we was all cool with each other. It's so competitive. Oh, and yeah. some people yeah. take it so personal when they lose. Yeah. 
Oh, definitely. And the questions will come out like, how come you won? Is it because your, your hair is different to mine or something? <laughs> I don't know. Like when you moved your head, did your hair flick in a way that was sexy or something? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you've ever won a battle like that? Because of my hairstyle? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I used to shave it back in the days, but maybe now it would be a different story, you know just what I mean? Just imagine it's like, fuck his turntablism. It's just about the hair, isn't it? Have you, have you ever been in a random situation where there's an American artist, for example, a big American artist, and they're like, yo, our DJ got held up at the airport. I need a DJ. You up for it? Um... Uh, it's got to have happened. You've been around a long time, bro. I'm trying to think. And if it hasn't happened, just make something up. <laughs> no one watches the channel anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Why am I here? Why am I here? <laughs> what made you get into the battle inside of things? Well, I used to watch a lot of uh, DMC tapes in the early days. You know, uh, Cut Master Swift. That's got to be the best one, isn't it? Cut, oh, Cut Master Swift used to kill it, you know. Everyone remembers him from the 1989 stuff, but I really like his 1988 DMC. Remind me which one it was where he left the turntables, stepped back and started doing the whop. That's when he won it in 1989. That was at the World Finals. I was there right at the front. Wow. Yeah, wow. I was there. Amazing. Wow. It just blew me away. I was like, I mean, I, obviously, because I knew him as well, not closely or anything like that at the time. I just knew him. But when I saw that, I was just, poof. Like yeah, he's he killed taken it. it to another level. Yeah, he killed it. He's brought entertainment to oh, it. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. But I prefer... I like that set, but I like the energy of that set and some of the stuff he was doing and some of the tricks. And that turntablism was in its really infant stages back then, you know what I mean? But I really like his set the year before, from 1988, and he's doing, like, this echo scratch. Cash money. Game changer, right? Oh, yeah, totally. So clean. Who to you is the biggest game changer in turntablism? I think there's been a few over the years, you know, uh, you know, like from the early days, Cheese, DJ Cheese, Grandmaster Flash, Cash Money, Jazzy Jeff. I'd say like, you know, that was like the, the next generation when they started bringing in transforming and like, you know, fast chirps, and, you know, all the, these are scratch techniques, by the way, for people that, that don't know. And they made them sound really clean and dope. Um, and they was put, making all kinds of cool tricks. Master Swift did, uh, you know, he was one of the first to do beat juggling. And Steve D from the X-Men, that's now the Executioners. Then I think we had a, a little later, we had, um, you know, the q -Berts, Invisible Scratch Pickles. Beat Junkies, Executioners, Rob Raider, Rest in Peace, yes, Rob Swift. Over to the UK side. Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, you know, uh, we've got the Enforcers. Enforcers and Scratch. Uh, Scratch Perverts. Oh, yeah. Scratch Perverts really changed the game. You know what I mean? Uh, with some of the stuff that they was doing, they was doing some really, you know, exotic style of, of uh, mixing techniques. You know what I mean? Some really cool feedback stuff. Um, like doing the mad stuff like switching the mixer and you know like reversing the mixer and doing all kinds of like reverse scratches and yeah they, they brought something different to the game do you remember your reaction when you first saw like four five djs along this massive table with like 10 turntables and five mixers and the first per people i saw do that was uh the rock steady djs which is now the Invisible Scratch Pickle. So it was Cuba, Mixmaster Mike, and DJ Apollo. And it was out of World Finals in, I think it was 92. Yeah, 92. And so I saw it a little bit later than that, more in the mid 90s. And my friend, DJ Crow, big up DJ Crow. He was very knowledgeable and he had loads of like cool records and like lots of hip hop videos. And he had a dub tape of uh, that that uh, US final, or it might have been the world finals of the Rocksteady DJs. And that's the first time I saw a, a crew of DJs all performing like a band. It's like working at McDonald's. You're on the fries, you're <laughs> yeah. on the burgers, you're on the floor yeah. cleaning. Everyone had their place. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like you'd, you'd have Mixmaster Mike cutting up a beat, Qbert cutting up a vocal, and then someone cutting up a stab, you know? So, yeah, yeah it was cool. Who's your favorite DJ? I'm curious. Oh, it's hard to name one, you know, like all the people that I mentioned before. 
So did you invent the word turntablism? No, I certainly didn't. I don't know who did. It's either between DJ Disc or DJ Babu. Both dope DJs. Who cares invented the word? It sounds cool. It's a good way to describe, you know, what we do as scratches or whatever, but yeah. Uh, we had an interview with three guys the other day, DJ Manipulate, Cut Class, and Toes One. And when I said the word turntablism, DJ Manipulate said he didn't really like that word for himself. What, what do you feel? I don't mind it. I think it describes, you know, what we do as scratching. It, it sounds okay, you know. Uh, I don't really use it to describe myself. Like, I'm turntablist rasp, or you know what I mean? Rasp the turntablist. I know some DJs use that title, uh, but I suppose turntablist, turntablism, it sounds cool. It describes, you know, what, what we do on the decks, I suppose. Yeah, it's okay, I don't mind it. Where did your name come from? I used to do graffiti back in the days, and uh, there was a graffiti writer called Stock from Liverpool. Okay. And uh, he gave me the name. He named me Rasp. I used to write something. I've, I've written a few names, you know, tagging. I was a young kid, you know what I mean, back in the days. And uh, yeah, he, he gave me the name and then, you know, lots of people started using that for my name. And I thought, okay, I'll use that. Did he explain where the name came from? Why he said that? I don't know. He just like, he just like a bit of a joke one day. He just sort of come in the room and said, "Oh, you little rasper or something." And then you know, people, so it started from banter. Yeah, just from a bit okay. of banter. You know what I mean? And then it's like, up. yeah, big up stock. Hope that you're okay, man. Not seen you for a few years. Hope that you're still writing on them walls and being creative and that. So I want to create a little scenario, and I want to know what procedure you would take to make sure that you walked out the victor in this situation. Okay. Right? <laughs> so, it's a world battle. There's two people left, and those two people are you and Prime Cuts. Oh, man, come on. You're losing, no, right? Oh, no, come on. That, you're losing. <laughs> let's not go there. Let's not go. I don't battle anymore, you know what I mean? I, I used to battle, and I used to find it fun, but now I've moved on from that, you know what I mean? I still respect it and everything. Prime Cuts is a legend, you know what I mean? It's like, he's... You know, he's a different generation from me. And uh, yeah, he's uh, he's changed the game quite a lot. You know what I mean? And I've got a lot of respect for him and all the scratch perverts. So you've won how many titles in what? Okay, um, I started winning competitions around about 2006, like regional DMC finals uh, and started getting the UK finals. I was in the UK finals every year since then. Um, then I won my first UK title in 2009 and that was for the DJ Battle for Supremacy for the DMC uh, then the same year won the IDA technical category IDA is International DJ Association it used to be ITF which was the International Turntablist Federation it just rebranded and uh, yeah so I was the double champion that year the year after I won uh, IDA defended my title I won the IDA technical category and yeah I won uh, basically two supremacy titles DMC the DMC classic battle and I won five IDA UK titles and it was a hell of a ride so how many rounds did you have to go through to get to the final title with some of them you had to do like regional heats and then some battles that I did it was like uh, head to head so it was like supremacy. So it was like a knockout style tournament DJ battle. You know what I mean? So sometimes you'd have to DJ about four, five, six DJs in that tournament, you know, until it got whittled down to one DJ or whatever. Do you remember your toughest competition? Oh, I've had quite a few tough competitions. <laughs> and yeah, uh, there must have been one. Yeah, uh, there's a few actually. Uh, there was a guy from Japan that I had to battle in the World Finals in 2009. That was really tough. Uh, not, not, none of the battles that I've done has been easy because it's all very unpredictable, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I've had a few tough battles. Is there one that you remember where you were just kind of shitting bricks really, thinking, shit, I've got to go up against this guy? There's been a few of them as well. <laughs> Have you ever battled Tiger Star? Uh, 
not one on one. I've been in the same battle as him, uh, you know, uh, in a DMC. And yeah, Tiger Styles is an amazing DJ. Yeah, he, he, he used to crush it. Um, yeah, so I've been in the same battle as him in, I think it was in Birmingham 2002. I had a DMC regional. But everyone like did six minutes and they picked, you know, the best overall. Uh, yeah, Tiger Style killed it. How many titles has he got? Uh, I think he's got three world titles. So on paper, you're better than him. No, man, it, it's not about that. It's just it, his path is different from my path. You know what I mean? It's like I'm not better or worse than anyone. Everyone has their own path. You know what I mean? He, he was my tour DJ for a little while. I and remember. Every show was just ridiculous. It's like when, when he was on the turn, turntables, I just had to step back and just watch in awe because it was mind blowing. Oh yeah. But to be fair, like pretty much all the DJs that I've had on tour have been on that kind of level. Oh, definitely. You've had all the scratch perverts. Not all. Mixologists. Yeah, mixologists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had Benny G. Um, grasshopper. Was, grasshopper. Like Grasshopper was like pretty much the longest in, in what I was doing. Right. You know what I mean, and, and we've stayed friends ever since. He's, he's more like a brother than anything, you know? And, uh, and he traveled all the way from Belgium all the time to come wow. to the show. So that says a lot about the guy as well, doesn't That's it? That's dedication. What did you feel like when you won your first title? Like, I've been battling a long time before I won my first UK title, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm, I've been clean living for a long time. I've been clean living since, like, 2000. So you didn't even no. set fire to your turntable or smash no. it on someone's head? I went to my hotel room and had a cup of tea. Wow, yeah, that's how that's that's how I roll. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, we, we, there was a party. There was an after party afterwards. You know what I mean? So you know, just celebrating with people, just just with your cup of tea. Like, yeah, with my brew. <laughs> <laughs> Explain to me um, some of the best experiences, or a couple of the best experiences that you picked up along the way. I've been very grateful to uh, experience a lot of different things with DJing. You know, there's been a lot of variety in my career and I hope to continue, you know, doing stuff. Like, you know, I've been on tour, did a Chinese tour. So I toured all over China. Um, I went to, uh, you know, New York. All off the back of winning the... the yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, also, like, working alongside manufacturers, like DJ manufacturers, like uh, Vestax and Rain, Sponsor Newmark. Sponsorships. Yeah, yeah, sponsorship. Okay. And doing stuff with them, like little tours or demonstrations and that. And, you know, getting certain gig opportunities. I'm working alongside different DJs, supporting different DJs. Like, it was a really big honour. I supported uh, Jazzy Jeff. Wicked. At the BPM show in Birmingham at the NEC. Uh, and that was a massive honour, you know, it was like a hero of mine and then uh, I warming, warming up for him, you know what I mean? And yeah, it was, I didn't get to speak to him for a long time, but he was a really nice dude, really humble guy. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to have these opportunities, but I put a lot of work in, you know, uh, doing the competitions. But it's not just doing the competitions, there's the other side of it, it's building relationships with people. Um, and just being around in the scene, you know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scene to, to get you moving in the scene. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like you set the legwork up and then you do what you do and then you use those experiences to take you somewhere different, you know? So yeah. if you're lucky enough to be in them kind of positions, because I don't think people understand the amount of work you've got to put in and... Like, just never give up. Oh. Always believe in yourself. Yeah. You're always going to get people knocking you, telling you you're, you're rubbish. And, oh, defo. You know, so what what kept you going? I think just the passion that I have for music, you know. And uh, like I said before, it's a way of me expressing myself. And uh, yeah, just, just that and just, you know, the excitement of it. The excitement of doing gigs and... You know, being creative has never left me. So I hope to continue that. You know, I don't think there's an age limit on when you should stop. Just if you enjoy doing it, just carry on doing it. So did you ever get your mom kind of going, stop with that rubbish, oh, yeah. chicky, chicky, wiggy, yeah. chicky, wiggy? All the time. My mum and, and dad, you know, they were, you know, 
back in the days, it's like, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And then you could have always answered by saying, look, if I'm not scratching the records, I'll be scratching my balls. Which one works better for you? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> But yeah, they, they um, you know, they, they started to get it after a while. They started, oh, right, okay, so you're being creative and, you you know, you, you're doing gigs and stuff like that and you can make a little bit of money out of it or whatever, you know what I mean? And you're meeting people and it, and it was a positive thing, you know what I mean? It was keeping me out of trouble, you know. I'd say doing DJing and getting involved in, with hip-hop taught me, you know, to, to have a lot of self-discipline and, um, you know, it kept me out of trouble, you know, as a kid growing up, you get into all kinds of mad stuff, you know, especially from a, you know, working class northern town or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, just like anywhere, really, you know, there's a lot of, like, bad distractions. So, you know, I think DJ kept me on a positive uh, focus. Again, it comes down to, you know, the dedication that keeps you focused on what you need to do and all of that helps to keep you off the streets and in the bedroom practicing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then look at, like I said, look where it led to, the achievements, the sponsorships, everything else. Look, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not that many people that have been in your position. No, I'm, I'm very grateful for, you know, everything really. Uh, but it's not been easy, you know. Like for me, especially the battling thing, that took me a long time to... Uh, really discover what I needed to do, you know, discover my style, develop my style, and then be comfortable with it, and, you know, be able to perform it, and, you know, have the confidence to, to do battles, and do well in battles, you know, it, it was a long slog for me, you know, my path is different from some of the DJs, you know, that you might have heard of, you know, the, the younger DJs, or like A-Track, he, he, he entered once, and then he ended up winning a world title, you know, my, my path was very different from that. Mine was more of a long slog. And, uh, and and you didn't mention Craze. Yeah, well, no, Craze actually had a bit of a long slog, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah he... he... No, I'm saying earlier when you were mentioning a bunch of DJs. Oh, yeah, well, I'm Allies. Amazed. Yeah, I meant to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, meant, meant to mention them. Yeah, the Allies, all of the Allies. Craze, A-Track, Clever, Spectacular, uh, Develop. All them guys were amazing, you know. Still amazing, you know. They're still pushing things but they've gone in a different direction now you know what I mean but so have you yeah yeah we've got to evolve so you've gone you've gone from being this kid that got these belt drive turntables to being this kid that basically practiced endless hours endless years to win all these titles and then you took that experience and you put it into something else do you want to tell us about that okay yeah uh well I've, I've done a few things with it but yeah I've, I've run a little DJ agency and uh, yeah, you know, I just supply like certain venues with, with DJs and just, you know, get people involved and get them gigs and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, yeah, that's been a ride in itself, you know, so I'm learning about business and all that type of stuff. And yeah, it's great, you know, it's very positive and yeah, but it comes with its things, you know what I mean? Like any business does, there's ups and downs, but yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to know quite a lot of decent DJs and, uh, you know, for using, like, social media as well. It's a good platform to, like, connect with other DJs and, you know, offer work if there's work there and stuff. Just to show people the level that you're at with that, do you want to tell people how many people you've had on your roster and do you want to also promote for anyone who's interested in reaching out because they're looking for an agent in case well, it's something you can build on? I'm not an agent uh, as regards to like, you know, getting big club gigs. It's more like bar gigs, you know, that I cater for. Uh, and I, I even cater for some of the, um, you know, the mobile disco style gigs. Is that know, a like, choice or just um, not being able to expand it to the other? Yeah, level? I just want to expand it and try different things. So you know, that comes with time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes, you know what I mean? But yeah, just, just hit me up on Instagram, just send me a message. Do you want to look in the camera and tell people? If you're interested in joining the agency or whatever, just send me a message on Instagram and uh, we'll have a chat. Do you want to give me your Instagram? Yeah, my Instagram's just that DJ Rasp. Is there, like, just moving away from the agency thing, because I just wanted to make sure you got a little bit of a promotion on that. Is there any artist 
in the world that you wished at some point you DJ for? Oh, wow. It's... Someone that blew your mind to the point where you're like, I don't care. I'll have that person's kids and everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Oh, there's so many. Uh, I, would, I would like to jam with people, you know what I mean? So... With, with other DJs, like all the DJs I mentioned before, that I'd love to jam with every single one of them DJs, you know, just have a little cut-up session. Um, but, you know, to DJ for like a rapper, you mean? Or yeah, a yeah. singer or someone, rapper, someone singer. like that. I mean, like, say, for example, Amy Winehouse. Would have, would yeah, that, have grabbed yeah your I'd, I'd love to do that, you know what I mean? I've, I've, I've done, it, done stuff like that with, with bands. You know, I've been in a ton of bands growing up, you know, like funk bands and all of that type of stuff, we, uh, doing the DJing for them. Uh, I'm actually in a band now, uh, but that's, we're going a little bit off top, topic there. But to, to get back to your question and, you know, think of a D, uh, of a, of an artist that I like to DJ for. I like to DJ Dead alongside. Uh, Cypress Hill, I think that'd, that'd be fun. To DJ alongside them. Wu-Tang Clan. Um, Oh, there's so many, you know. Uh, even like some rock bands, you know, incorporate some scratching into some Iron Maiden tracks what or whatever, you know what I mean? Or... Yeah, something like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it kind of work with the hairdo yeah. as well, wouldn't it? <laughs> like, just let it loose yeah, and yeah. flick it about and you're <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, well, some uh, rock bands have like DJs now, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, yeah, it's I was, cool. Yeah, I was hearing about uh, Mixmaster Mike. Yeah, he... he, he uh, does stuff with all kinds of bands and you know obviously the Beastie Boys and all that when when they was going uh, but yeah it's great to see you know uh, it's good that it's like you know the DJ is a you know is is basically a musician if 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 you want it to be you know what I mean using the turntables as a you know instrument and it's just as respected as a guitar or drums or keyboard or whatever is there anything else that you really want to get out there and let people know about okay well i've been getting to uh djing with videos lately oh yeah so I've been doing, gonna... yeah i've been doing the av shows and uh, i'm finding that a lot of fun you know uh, so combining visuals with sonics uh yeah i'm having a lot of fun doing that you know the much respect to dj woody dj yoda mike realm they're all like pioneers of that but yeah i'm, I'm having fun Exploring that and doing a couple of gigs by doing that now, you know. So, so how did that how did that come about? Um, I was DJing for a venue a little while ago, and they asked me to put a show together. You know, they had a big screen in that, and uh, yeah, that's I just got into it like that really. And then I thought, okay, maybe I could do something like this on a regular basis. And I was DJing every now and again in some venues that had screens, and with the new technology you know, and the new uh, laptops, it's a lot more sturdy uh, to do that now, you know what I mean? So, yeah, just just having fun, just watching YouTube clips or movies, chopping up bits of uh, film, and then, you know, applying that to the music when I'm DJing. Some of it's, like, well thought out, and some of it I can do on the fly now, you know. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's fun. But there's a lot of prep involved. You know what I mean? There's a lot of like you got to know which parts you're cutting out. Yeah, yeah. You got to watch a lot of stuff. You know what I mean? So basically, it is turntablism, but with videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, just general DJing. You know what I mean? But I, I do add scratch into it. But yeah, and I, like I say, I play all kinds of music, so I can apply a lot of different visuals with the different types of music when I'm playing. You know what I mean? Uh, but a lot of it is using Final Cut and chopping up, you know, clips and then, you know, archiving them and, uh, yeah, adding them to your DJ set. So are you sponsored for that? No, no, I just, I use Serato. Uh, I believe you can use other DJ software, but I just find Serato just works well with that. And I, I just like using Serato anyway. So what's, what's your aim with, with that? What are you trying to achieve from that? With the video shows, yeah. just to entertain people okay. and entertain myself, you know what I mean? Just It's just something different, you know what I mean? I, I like doing different things with DJing, not just, you know, the same thing, you know what I mean? I like, uh, you know, I like exploring different avenues of DJing, 
So yeah, I'm exploring that avenue right now, as well as doing other things. You know, I'm, I'm into production and, you know, I'm into uh, creating music on the turntables. I'll still always make routines and little DJ sets and stuff. And yeah, it's just another avenue to explore using the visuals. With your production, how long have you been producing and where can people find your work if anyone's interested in working with you? Okay, I've been producing on and off for a few years now. Uh, you know, 10 years, 15 years or something. And it, I just do it for fun, really. You know so what I mean? it's not up on a website anywhere? Uh, right? Yeah, there's a few tracks that I've, I've put out. You know, you can find them on Spotify or, you know, on YouTube or whatever. And I've collaborated with different people. I've collaborated with TL, Tony Broke from Liverpool, uh, Dave the Rough from Manchester. And I've done a few of my own tracks. And I've done, like, different styles of music as well. So, yeah, just, just check it out on YouTube. Just, you know, type, under, under DJ Rasp. Yeah, just type in DJ Rasp and you'll find a lot of my scratching videos, but you'll see some of my productions as well. Any final words? Thanks for having us and it's been a pleasure. Bro, I appreciate you making the journey. Like I said, it's a long way to come, but that just goes to show that when you're dedicated with something, you'll make that journey. And he's also got a couple of um, DJ sets that he done here at 521, so look out for those. Anything else you want to add to that last bit there? Check us out on Instagram, DJ Rasp, on YouTube. Sometimes I do on Facebook, and, and sometimes I do on TikTok as well. Sometimes I do live streaming on TikTok. And uh, yeah, yeah, check us out on, on the web. If you want to keep in the loop with what DJ Rasp is up to currently, please follow him on all his connection pages linked in the description below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell to receive the notifications, like, share, get involved in the comments section below, and also follow 521 and myself, Blade, on our respective Instagram pages. Until next time, don't wait for nobody to do what you could do for yourself. Peace. I like that, man. Thank you very much.